Let me ask you to turn to Titus and chapter 1. Titus and chapter 1. Titus and chapter 1. Let me read um, once again from verse 1. Paul, a born servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus, a true son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince or convict those who contradict. I draw your attention to verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. We have asked that question, where do we begin from? Where do we begin from when we are a church that is in a mess or planting a new church? We begin from preaching the gospel, thinking about salvation or indeed uh, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also must be thinking about uh, appointing godly leaders, godly leaders. If that church is to maintain the gospel, there must be godly leaders. And Paul gives the qualification of uh, these godly leaders, he gives one general qualification that seems to be running through all the other qualifications. It is an overarching qualification. It is that he must be blameless. He must be blameless. He must be blameless. And he tries to make us understand what uh, that means. He must be blameless. Obviously, it doesn't mean he must be without sin, but what does that mean, or what does that look like? He then gives us this specimen. He gives us these details, these specifics. He says uh, that um, with regard to his domestic competence or domestic affairs, he must be a one-woman man. Okay? So there must be morality in this man. There must be morality in this man. But we have also said that uh, he must have uh, uh, good leadership. And that good leadership seen through the submission um, in his children, the obedience in his children. Okay. Um, um, but uh, secondly, in the broader category, it's not just his domestic, but it's also his personal character. And we looked last week at the negative uh, in terms of his personal character, what he must not be as uh, a Christian or a Christian man. 
or, or a Christian simply, what he must not be. He, as we are told in verse 7, he must not be self-willed. He must not be quick-tempered. He must not be given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. In most of these qualifications, the concern is uh, the relationship with uh, the church, members of the, of the people of God, uh, because obviously if he's a quick-tempered man, there will always be sparks in the church of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This uh, evening, I want to look at the positives, the positives as we have them in verse 8 of, um, of, um, of chapter 1. So we are looking, therefore, at the qualifications of an elder, particularly his personal character in the positive, his personal character positively. His personal character positively. So we are told that he must be hospitable. This man must be hospitable, or he must be hospitable. Um, that word is uh, suggesting or does make reference to the fact that he must be a lover of strangers. An elder must be a lover of uh, strangers. Uh, that is, um, if we make reference to the first letter of Timothy, uh, you find um, that well uh, listed there in chapter 3 and verse 2. So in those days, the picture here is that in those days, there were no lodges or motels as we know them now. So the, the, the travelers were hosted by Christian travelers were hosted in, by uh, fellow believers in their homes. And that is the concern of that, uh, that verse. But furthermore, the concern of this characteristic is not just to the strangers, but also generally is to show love to the members of the household of God. Is to show love to the members of the household of God. Peter puts it this way in chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 4 of uh, First Peter. He says in chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, um, um, let me begin at, uh, at verse uh, 8, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things have fervent love, he says, love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Verse 9 says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. So you can see that concern is uh, in as much as the word used is show love to strangers, but he all, that encompasses also the love within the local church or love within the community of believers. An elder, therefore, must have genuine love and concern for the people of God. Because Peter says there, as we underline, that we must be hospitable to one another without grumbling. It must be genuine. It must not be after you have saved another or somebody and as they have gone, it is uh, they have taken my rest. This was the last thing that I had and it has all been squandered. And I don't know how I will recover from this. And uh, well, that is not what he is promoting here. We must be lovers of strangers, but also lovers of uh, one another, entertaining one another as it were. There must be a wholeheartedness in the service of hospitality, in the service of hospitality. Generally, Paul encourages every Christian. This is not 
as we have said in the other virtues, this is not just for elders. He is encouraging Christians to be hospitable. And um, you read a few verses and uh, think that uh, will communicate. If you read, for instance, uh, Romans and, um, and chapter 12, uh, Romans and chapter 12, uh, you hear the, the words of the Apostle Paul. Um, he says in uh, chapter 12 and that verse 13, um, uh, verse 9 says, be, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in prayer, saving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Verse 13 says, uh, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, given to hospitality as saints, given to hospitality. It is a habit that we must cultivate. It is a habit that all of us must be, be pursuing. Lovers of strangers and lovers of, this, of, of um, the community of believers. Uh, chapter, chapter 13 of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 13 of Hebrews. And uh, reading from verse 1 says, uh, let, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Okay, loving others. And it is a virtue that um, the writer to the Hebrews also uh, promotes that we should, uh, the word he uses there is, uh, is those two words, entertain strangers. It is show hospitality, basically. Show hospitality. And um, that uh, we must do because we are in the body, he says, because we ourselves are flesh and blood. Just as we would want to be entertained by others, we must be in the habit. We must be in the habit. Shepherding souls, therefore, will demand that the shepherds, the under shepherds, love their flock. Love their flock. Otherwise, how would you, how would you shepherd? I know that we have different uh, temperaments, uh, different uh, personalities, and obviously those are not cast in concrete, they can change. But nonetheless, the elders, with what is obtaining, must still love, must still be hospitable, must still be entertaining the flock of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, second, he says that an elder, yes, must be hospitable or hospitable, but also he must be the lover of what is good. This is closely related to hospitality. It is the lover of people. That is what hospitality is. Uh, the opposite that is not, uh, the opposite of that, uh, being the lover of good, is uh, being the lover of self. Or being the lover of money or being the lover or being the haters of good. As uh, we see that list in, in 2 Timothy and chapter 3. 2 Timothy and chapter 3. When Paul says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers 
disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, notice what he says, despisers of God. That's the opposite of what here he's saying that an elder must be, must be a lover of good. This list says in the last days, people will despise good. They will be lovers of self, lovers of, of money. The word that he uses is to have a great affinity to the things that we might call good. We must have great affection to those things that we might call good. So these are various things. An elder must be a lover of good. It can be things, it can be people, it can be uh, activity. He must be lover of good. He must be a lover of good. So in this case, if I may give an example, he must be a lover of scripture, for instance, because that is good. You remember what uh, Paul to the Philippians mentions as he's encouraging them about not worrying. One of the ways to not worry is to think about what is good. Whatever is lovely, he says. Whatever is trustworthy, whatever is pure, whatever is good. So anything, he has that affection, he has that affinity to it. It, must, it can be perhaps... Uh, Books, good books, the lover of good. He's a lover of fellowship, Christian fellowship. He is a lover of uh, godly people. He is not uh, like those who rejoice with the wicked, who sit in the council of the wicked. He wants to walk. He wants uh, to sit in with the with the wise he is a lover of doing good so generally he is saying an elder must be a lover of good a christian must be a lover of good isn't it he must be a lover of good anything that benefits others that is good he must be a lover of good as opposed to the love for self, as I've said, as opposed to despising good, which is what uh, the world is like. The world hates good. It calls good evil and evil good. Christians must genuinely love what is good, must genuinely love what benefits <coughs> others. But thirdly, he says he must be hospitable, he must be a lover of good, but he must also be sober-minded. He must be sober-minded. The meaning there is um, he must be sensible. He must be sensible. Or he must be, the implication is that he must be a prudent and wise person. This man must have uh, a perspective and priorities that are very clear in his mind, in his action. It must be clear perspective, very clear perspective. A person who is uh, going to exercise uh, discretion A person who is, over, who is going to, dis, to exercise prudence over practical issues and the problems of the people. Because he's going to be dealing with people. He's going to be dealing with people with, with problems because uh, human beings have problems. He himself has issues and therefore he must be, he must be very prudent very prudent, very sensible, as the word is uh, put uh, simply. A sober-minded person will have um, 
a sound judgment. He will have a healthy judgment. He will make decisions that are very sound, even in moments that are extremely challenging. He will not be influenced by circumstance or because of friendship or because of relationship. You know what it is, isn't it? When, they are, when, when, we, we, when, people, are, when people are employing, is that the, the, most of the judgment is very impaired. Isn't it? That, that's, that's the opposite of what, what Paul is pushing. The, the sober-mindedness is to have clear perspective. We want somebody with these qualifications, with this experience, and this is how it will be. We will not look at the face, or we will not look at the color, we will not look at anything else. Because in times of problems, you may be influenced by friendship and make judgment that is not a godly judgment. That is not being sober-minded. Like someone who narrates of a king who was very just, or was sober-minded. And he was known to be the very holy man, very, very upright, as it were. When the crime was committed by the mom, so when they were when they were finding out who stole this, and whoever stole this, like uh, the Old Testament would say, would die, and then they found out that it was the mom. And the mom was very aged. So the judgment was passed that he must, she must be flogged. Those Old Testament, uh, those Bible flogging is 31 plus, is it 39 plus 1? This man obviously knew that uh, the mom was not going to survive. But if I change my goalpost, then I become obviously unjust. I'm not sober in my perspective. It will be very clear that uh, here it is about relationship. And this man says, uh, we will spank her 39 lashes. And as they're preparing to spank, he comes down and takes off his jacket and he is the one who is hit. Justice still prevails. It is a sober-minded person who even in the most challenging moments still maintains perspective. Still maintains perspective. This is very important virtue because Paul repeats it several times in this text. Notice chapter 2. In this book, sorry. Notice chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says that the older man must have this virtue. The older man, he says, be that the older man be sober. He says, Verse 5, to be discreet, it's the same word he is using. He says with regard to the older women that they admonish the younger women to be lovers of, uh, of their husbands, to be lovers of, the, of, of their children. But verse 5 says, to be discreet, it's the same word to be sober-minded. Verse 6, he says, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. So sober-mindedness is not a virtue of the odd. It is a virtue that must be found in young men also. In young men. Young men must have uh, on their shoulders a head that is of an adult with regard to this virtue. He says in verse 12, I read verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us 
that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should uh, live, he says, soberly. Should live soberly. So circumstance must not make us excited um, as it is in, in children. Um, I think there, there was that uh, uh, clip that was going viral over a kid who, um, when he saw people, he began to do somersaults. And because there was a banquet laid, he, his last somersault was very fatal. He landed into, into the pot of, of a meal. Is that, that's, that's the characteristics of kids. You, 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 they, they get worked up to start showing off or pleasing those that are, are visiting. They must, even if they are children, they must have this characteristic and virtue to be sober-minded, to, to have a perspective. He says, he must be hospitable, he must be a lover of good, he must be sober-minded. Fourthly, is that he must be just. An elder must be upright. A person who loves, or a person who lives to the righteous standards of God. He is... Uh, he is a person who is upright because uh, such that the, the church can rely on him to make fair and just decisions in the church of our Savior Jesus Christ. He must be upright. He must be upright. This virtue promotes credibility of an elder to lead the church. No one wants to be led by a dishonest fellow who will be changing his goalposts, who is not trusted at all, who is not fair. And usually it is when the church begins to see that others are treated as though they have more legs than the others. Others are four, others have two legs. Others are haves and others are have not. Then it is very clear here is no, there is no equity. The elders have partiality. And that must not be said about the elders. They must not have partiality. And this usually is, this sees itself in... Uh, in most cases, when there is a discipline, how it is handed, handled very differently. And the church members have got eyes to observe. When the church begins to grumble, and there's unfairness here. It doesn't matter whether you say, no, we are fair the church will be destroyed. There's no way that the church will maintain that gospel witness. An elder, therefore, must be very fair in executing their duties and responsibilities as they lead the church, there must be equity. There must be fairness. That the church, therefore, can count on them. The church can count on them. It is very sad when uh, you hear that Wabufi. Uh, and who is who are you telling Wabufi? It's an elder. Because this man changes. One, one moment he's saying this, and then a moment he's saying something else. And when he makes a judgment, it is uh, when he is with this guy, he makes a different judgment, and with other guys, different judgment, as it were. There must be fairness. There must be fairness. That is a virtue 
that uh, must be in an elder. It is not obviously easy, and the reason why we must be dependent on God, the Holy Spirit, and dependent on his word to work in us a sanctification. Fifthly, an elder must be holy. An elder must be holy. That's a word we have there. He must be sober-minded. He must be just as being fair. He must be holy. And that is, he must be devout. He must be devout to God and his word. He is person, a person whose life is consecrated to God and his word. He is committed to serve God. One commentator says, despite the changing wind in the culture and in circumstance, the devout man faithfully clings to God and his word. When culture swings to the left, the faithful man remains. He must be committed to his Savior, despite the changing times. It is very sad sometimes when I hear people say we have actually matured. It's a, it's a, it's a way of saying we have changed. An elder must maintain commitment. God and his word. When you have swung because of circumstance, because of culture, you are not being devout. You are not being mature. An elder, therefore, must be one that is committed to his savior. Lastly, which is the sixth thing, is that he must be self-controlled. Listen to this once again. He must be hospitable. He must be lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy. But lastly, is that he must be devout. An elder must be, sorry, must be self-controlled. An elder must be self-disciplined in all aspects of his life. Listen to what Paul says in First Corinthians and um, chapter First Corinthians and chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse uh, twenty-seven. Let me pick it from verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the price? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the price is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline, that's the word, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I discipline my body. That's the word he is using, the self-control. I discipline my body in all aspects of life. He is talking about mastering or having mastery over oneself, over your body, over your emotions, over your desires, over your choices, over your appetites, over your will. He says, I discipline. An elder must be self disciplined or must have self, must be self controlled. 
a disciplined man, which is what the, why he is, I think, he is uh, saying that this must be a virtue. A disciplined man fortifies his soul from danger, from spiritual danger. He fortifies his soul from a lot of evils. The temptation in this world and the, from the arch enemy, the devil himself. Listen to what Paul, sorry, the Solomon says in Proverbs, in Proverbs and uh, chapter 25. Chapter 25, I read verse, um, reading at verse 27. It is not good to eat much honey. So to eat such, to seek one's own glory is not glory. Whoever has uh, no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without wars. A man who is not disciplined is like a city without walls. I'm sure this doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to most of us. He is saying it is, a, it is a home without security. It is a home where you sleep with your door wide open and your gate wide open. That poses a lot of threat. A man who does not have self-control opens his soul to a lot of evil. A lot of evil. So therefore, self-discipline is a sure defense of the soul. Without it, people will become extremely vulnerable. Extremely vulnerable. And that is why we must train one another and uh, from little things to big things. Because that discipline begins from little things and it works itself to big things. For instance, it, work, it starts from just sleeping, isn't it? Oversleeping is lack of self-control. So we begin from those little things. Failing to make my bed, failing to clean my, my things around me, is that you are going to open your soul to a lot of evil because that will escalate. When you fail to discipline yourself to the Lord's Day, for instance, that you must engage in worship of God, that in itself begins to open your soul to a lot of evils. Self-discipline is a defense. It is a defense. And we must be as Christians in that habit. It forbid it that it should be said <coughs> that the man comes late for work. That's lack of self-discipline, isn't it? Because that then begins to open you, even to grumble. No, it's only me. They like picking on me and whatnot. Yeah, because you come late. You have already opened yourself to a lot of evil because that will send you to lying. No, I have a, I have a puncture. Actually, I, it was head collusion with a truck. Even if Apamambo have survived, it's Makafe Akwalesa. That in itself has created, has opened your soul to begin to lie. Mastering, or someone saying, says to have a grip on self. Do you know why the church exercises church discipline? It's because the members of the church fail to discipline themselves. So the church helps them. The church helps them.
this virtue must be cultivated beginning from the kids as i've said we must train kids to have self control putting their knives on the throat when it is a banquet everything is beneficial yes everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial you tell yourself yeah i, I can do this but uh, see, it will have, it will have absolutely no profit no profit and you beat your body and subject it you will know communion with the lord jesus christ you will know growth in the lord listen this is a fruit of the spirit and that's what paul says in chapter 6 chapter 5 of galatians uh, i read that as i come to a conclusion chapter 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 5 Paul says in chapter 5 and verse 23 says, But the fruit, 22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. He says, uh, Self control is a fruit of the Spirit of God. Again, as such, there is no law. And those who and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, and it goes on and on. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So you notice that those, those virtues, therefore, as you go through the fruit of the Spirit or the list of the fruit of the Spirit, you discover that uh, they are actually graces. They are actually, they are actually fruit or the virtue or character of uh, a Christian. These uh, virtues are not peculiar to elders only should not be peculiar to elders only as we have said this is a mature man this is a mature man this is how a mature christian must look like this is how a mature christian must look like even when i can afford i tell myself i will not go that route Because that's a mature man. Self-control. Being devout, committed to God and his honor. Being just or fair in your judgment and being prudent, having a godly perspective and priority. And we have also said, loving whatever is good. That is a mature man. If the church of Jesus Christ is to maintain its savor, we must be choosing those that have these qualities. Those that have these qualities. And I want to end by saying, these nonetheless are not a province of elders only. Or a reserve, or preserve of elders only. Every Christian, this is what we must look like in our personal characteristics. This is how we must look like. May God help us. May God help us that we cultivate these virtues by his word, by the help of God, the Holy Spirit.
man. Um, I, I 